Hi guys, I'm Desi and this is Bridging the Realm. Tonight's guest is Helen Glover. She is originally from the UK and now has been living in Australia for the last 26 years. Helen has a hugely diverse background from being a counsellor for people with PTSD and HIV to a lifestyle coach to a personal life coach where she incorporates a number of spiritual te techniques allowing her clients to unlock their true potential and power to achieve their wildest dreams. Recently, Helen has launched a business called The Gentleman's Secret and a podcast where she addresses personal and mental health issues for men in our society today. Helen, thank you so much for being on Bridging the Realm. Welcome. Thank you, Desi. Lovely to be here. How are you today? How's everything in Australia? Yeah, I've got the heater on here. It's a little bit chilly tonight because it's night time to me and it's morning to you. So. Yeah, oh my God, you're like 15 hours ahead of me, I think. Oh no, nine. I'm nine at the moment and then in a couple of months I'll, I'll be back to 11. Ah, okay. Oh God, yeah, it's strange when you're, when the time difference is so, so vast. Um, mm. But yeah, so you've um, recently launched your podcast. Just the concept of it is absolutely fascinating to me. Um, let's start with that. And what made you go into this area in the first place? Mm. Well, the podcast is The Modern Masculine. Um, the Modern Masculine to me, it's really, um, I just see a gap really. I think for me, when I look at our society, I see a lot of divine feminine rising, a lot of women's networking. I do a lot of women's circles myself and I um, also do retreats and I hold circles and, um, and um, yeah, do listening, um, talking sticks and we do smudging and all these beautiful rituals for women to yeah. connect and really drop into these deeper levels. Um, and there's a lot of stuff going on that's not really been talked about, almost that shadow side of the divine rising, the divine feminine rising. So for me, I think, yeah, we're, we're getting our power back, but we need to also make sure that within the divine feminine rising that we keep our, our feminine power within that, that we keep the softness that is the, the feminine within us and we don't just fight the masculine with our masculine yeah not a power grab it's actually about creating a beautiful equality between our sexes so that we can come together and unless we start to really hear each other's stories we keep creating another battle within saying well you this or they that and we keep growing that um, narrative that doesn't support at the end of the day this beautiful connection between mm. both of us and it doesn't matter whether, um, I don't think it's, it's even about your sexuality. It's about just as coexisting as genders, um, as whatever that looks like for you, you know? Yeah. So, um, yeah, I, I feel that there's a lot of talk, um, but men aren't necessarily feeling that they're being heard. And that can only build a resentment that then adds to the argument and separates us more from each other, which, yeah, I think for, yeah. for the good of the movement moving forward, for us to actually do what we're wanting, mm. there needs to be a point where we start listening. Mm. Yes, definitely. So it's interesting because you've worked both with women, but also in your past, you've worked a lot with men. So what yes. are the biggest differences that you find um, from working with both? What, what are, you know, do you find one, uh, like, for example, men, do they find specific things more challenging or um, as compared to women? Because I guess with women, it's a lot easier for us to speak to each other and let things out. We're a bit more emotional and things like that. We don't find it so difficult to express our emotions but with men like you said it's a lot more like they feel that they're not being heard so what are the biggest things that you've know that you noticed from your earlier work of working with men um that you thought wow this is this is definitely something that needs to be kind of looked mm. at well i find um men who seek help mm. when men make a decision and they seek you they've made a decision they want to change and what's amazing about that is then they will generally do the work. They've made a decision and so they're gonna do it. And what we're not really paying any attention to is that men have been raised by men who have not had any emotions 
and from men who have come from war. Yes. So um, we're coming on, off the back of World War I, uh, who raised the men who were in World War II, who then raised our fathers of, say, my generation. My dad's a war baby, and so then my generation. So we're still really only just coming down from the, the inability to really feel your feelings. And with a bunch of men who have got a lot of stuff that have never been spoken about. Mm. So... What I find when you take the ability to a man to actually know how to communicate, most of them love it. They go, oh, thank God there's a space for me. And a lot of it, it almost like you can see them starting to open and they start to become more receptive. And they're not closed once you start introducing them to something. They're quite... Um, able to grasp the concept and although it might be difficult for them they're willing to go there and once they start going there they're on the road you know they mm. want to keep going yeah. and it's really quite rewarding because they start to enjoy themselves more they start to experience their lives more they really do um yeah drop into a different place mm. yeah it's an awakening um, but the biggest difference I think between men and women back to that question is women, although we are, it's easier for us to talk. We're a lot less likely to act. Mm -hmm. There's a lot more procrastination around acting on our emotion, a lot more justification around why we're doing what we're doing. Mm -hmm. Um, and we can, we can explain it away because we are so good at communication. Yeah, totally. So, it's a double-edged sword, you know? Like I say, for every light, there's a dart. For every dart, there's a light, you know? So, um, yeah. We, yeah, we are very good with coming up with loads of excuses, isn't it? Oh, this is why I have to do this, and, you know, I was manipulated into that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But you, so one of your favorite phrases, uh, as we mentioned before, is permission granted. Tell me a little bit about what, do you, what you mean by that. Yeah, permission granted. I'm kind of the person they'll walk in and go, oh, look, there's the elephant. And everybody goes, oh, my God, you know, <laughs> I'm the one who will mention it. And generally, people are so glad that I have because everybody else wanted to but didn't. Um, in that, there's, you run a risk. You know, you run a risk that nobody did want to mention it or that you're going to cause some unrest or that it might be controversial or a bit difficult. But... Um, I find that once I say, oh, look, there's the elephant, like half of the room relaxes and goes, oh, thank God you've named the elephant. I've yeah. been dying to kind of call attention to it, but I just didn't want to do it. Yeah. So when I, I ran a show um, called What Happens If We Never Get Our Shit Together? Wow. And I sold tickets. And it was, I did about five shows. Oh, that sounds and it came off the back of... Um, I was going through a lot of stuff myself and I got fed up of not being allowed to really speak about it without being termed negative yeah, or, or pessimistic or, or by getting some kind of flippant um, meme from somebody to yeah. kind of shut down. Mm. And I got really annoyed about it. I just thought, you know, we need to stop pretending that our deeper emotion doesn't exist and I want to call it out. Yeah. So I stood on stage and I talked about some of my own experiences of some of the dark places that I visited and, mm. and some day-to-day -day stuff about having four children and about what mm. that looks like. And it's funny, but it's also, it's tough going. Yeah. And how with Facebook, um, I, I give an example on stage, for example, of a friend of mine put on Facebook that she'd been for this beautiful romantic dinner. And I was like, oh, wow, my God, you know, like, I'd love to have a partner to go to a romantic dinner. That was so beautiful. So next time I saw her, I said to her, oh, I saw that dinner. And she said, oh, we ne I never posted that later on in the car, we had a huge fight and we slept in different bedrooms. Oh, God. <laughs> and that's Facebook, right? So here I am going, you know, oh, God, it would be beautiful to be. Why do we do that? Yeah. yeah. But that's the, that's the highlight reel. And we don't get her posting at midnight, actually. I'm in my own bed now. We've just had a huge scrap. Yeah, <laughs> I know. We never hear the backside of it. Yeah. Yeah. So, so it's about calling out the reality that we don't all have our shit together. 
Mm. And as long as we can say that out loud, then everybody else in the room relaxes and they granted permission to not have their shit together either. Yeah. But once somebody turns up in the room talking about this great, perfect life, the pressure's on for everybody to do the same. Yeah. And my feeling is if we turn up and say, you know, I've had a really rough day. I'm really struggling at the moment with this. And, you know, I'm really wanting this to happen and it's not going well. And I'm really beating myself up about that. And mm. that also grants everybody permission yeah, to, to show up. Yeah. And they can go, oh, actually, I'm glad you've said that because X. But they're not going to do that if you paint your life as being beautiful. No. They're going to feel an awkward. Yeah. Totally. So we've just got a whole society of people walking around feeling inadequate. Mm. Permission granted to me is about connection as well. Mm. Our entire existence is about connection. And for me, I believe we're connected through our energy and through the earth's source energy. Yeah. So just our feet on the floor connects us. But we're not, um, we're just not paying attention to that because we're so obsessed with things and what's in our hands really. Mm. So instead of becoming more and more connected to things that are around us as far as natural and, and the connection, the energies between us yeah. and that the security and the safety that we get from that kind of village and that kind of group, mm. we're going outward for approval instead. Yeah. And approval is likes, it's momentary, it's an anxiety, it's not real yeah. whereas connectedness you don't have to chase approval because there's safety in it mm. and yes. so it, it creates great unrest yeah mm. i've seen that time and time again with um especially with um spiritual teachers the ones that i've seen are the most successful ones are the ones that are really kind of authentic and you know um uh, trying to just be who they are and trying to show all their imperfections to the world as well and not just being like, I'm a spiritual teacher, I'm perfect, look at me kind of thing. So yeah. I think it makes Well, sense. that's the thing. There's spiritual ego as well as there is um, corporate ego as well yeah. as there's the parenting ego. Mm. Every, you know, I, I laugh when you meet a spiritual person who says, you know, no judgment though. And it comes mm. from but I'm going to tell you what I think about it, but because I'm spiritual and I'm going to back it up with no judgment though, it means yeah. it doesn't apply, but actually, yes, it does. Exactly. There's a real um, snobbery into how people are dealing with their life in a spiritual community. Mm. So much as there is this snobbery around how people are parenting their child and about how people are showing up to work and how they're behaving towards their boss or their co-workers. Mm. And it comes from a deep insecurity. Yeah. Uh, and we need to embody our own insecurities in order to change this level of judgment because we can only ever come from our own body yeah. um so it has to start yeah. with us to be the reflection out of what we want to see reflected mm -hmm. back yeah you know? no totally so yeah. talk me through some of your own techniques and um everything that you've used up until now because i know you've uh you've talked previously about your own period of depression that you've gone through and kind of battle through yourself really bravely and i have to say you've just managed to do an amazing work coming going from there to here um what are some of the main things that helped you how did you manage to deal with that oh god i've had loads of depressions <laughs> <laughs> i think you um there are certain personality types who are a lot more sensitive to environment um mm. and um you know all the different personality tests around the world and that people do it, it shows how some personality types are more prone to this some more prone to that it's like anything some people really struggle with their physical body others struggle with their mental health others str struggle socially I think we all come with something that needs to be kind of cracked in this lifetime yeah. and for me I think it's been um my mental health my ability to um to just keep calibrating with my yeah. life. Um, and I've always been very sensitive to it. Um, so I believe that we do come into the experiences that we need. Yeah. So I certainly don't feel like that at the time. Mm. 
Yeah. <laughs> and beautiful at the end to go, oh, well, you know, it was the lesson and it was this. Whereas yeah. in the time, if somebody wants to tell me I'm in a lesson, I just want to punch them in the face. Exactly. <laughs> because I just think actually don't, don't come at me now with that because yeah. I just need to. You that spiritual me. talk doesn't work. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, but I think um, earlier in my life, it was ugly. You know, there was this real um, fear. I, I was worried I was going crazy. Mm. You know, I was worried about um, that I was the only person who felt like that. And I, mm. I mean, you know, we're talking 30 years ago or yeah. whatever. People didn't talk about it, you know. Yeah. And it was um, a lot more hush-hush than it is mm. now. And I mean, you know, you go to a doctor and they just go, oh, you need some fun things in your life. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Like to do this or that, um, the pill. Yeah, yeah. And I think uh, what happens when you're struggling as a teen and in your early twenties is you drink and you um, behave really strangely to mm. try and cover your emotion and yeah. you show up really inauthentically. And yeah. you're either an introvert or an extrovert, opposite to kind of what feels most comfortable. Yeah. And you do whatever it takes to kind of fit that shoe, but it's not who you are almost creates a double negative and then you have to repair from that event as well so I did navigate quite a lot of shame you know um, yeah. where I just was like oh my god you know like I just didn't like who I was and yeah. and I just had to I just started reading to be honest darling I just started reading and I read and read and I just kept really um showing up to myself when I knew I was talking rubbish I had to say you know what you're the only person you're fooling here like you know that's not true this mm. is actually you're doing this you feel like that and there was some real aha moments where on um, like beautiful Louise Hay back in the day she had a workbook um, where it had certain words you know, career, men, success, um, you know, love. And, and I wrote down what I thought, my first thoughts when I read those words. Yeah. And it was the first time I think I thought I was shocked about my own thoughts because I didn't actually identify with what I'd written. Mm -hmm. And that was then that kind of kick in of like, okay, so I think I've got a dual thing happening here, which yeah. is who I was born to be and um, what my society has kind of trained me to become. Mm. And so I realized the difference at that moment between yeah. shame and guilt. Uh -huh. And that was a huge thing that shame is society, a society construct. Yeah. So shame is done by society to you mm -hmm. and we hold it. Whereas yeah. guilt is personal. <laughs> Oh, okay. I've never thought of it like that. Yeah, that's actually mm -hmm. makes sense. Yeah. So it's really interesting when you're looking at any subject of a situation you've been in or anything you're beating yourself up about or anything, where is it coming from? Is it a public social construct mm. or, or is it personal? Is it a guilt that you're actually applying awesome. that then you can actually have self-compassion for and take control of that lead? Mm. Or is it a, a part where you have to apologize to somebody or is it outward or is it that you just need to hang around with a different crowd who don't shame you for doing that? You know, there's different ways then of, of navigating mm. that emotion. Yeah, totally. And that actually was quite a big realization. Mm. And, um, well, and of course, nuggets. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And of course there's all the meditation techniques and all of the, the obvious things people talk about, but to be honest, when you're really struggling, it's very, very hard to meditate. Oh, yeah. Because Definitely. I think we're using meditation as this broad brush, meditate and the world will be fine. And, yeah. you know, actually sitting in silence is an impossibility when you're in a dark place struggling. Oh, and a dark night soul, you're almost rocking because it's even hard to sit still. Yeah. Um, and maybe that's just my experience, but that's what it felt like for me is that just sitting still was too much. It was almost like I had to pace. Mm. It just 
kind of get that energy out of my body. And that's the other thing for me. Movement is huge. It's yeah. When I really, um, in the early days where, when it was very strong, I would move and, mm. and now I dance a lot, do lots and lots of dancing. Yeah. You mentioned that. That's yeah. So, um, let me just go back to, so the, when you were in that state, how long did it take you to, admit to yourself first of all that there is actually something wrong there and there is and you know you really do need to look at it because from what I've seen a lot of people just tend to kind of cover it up and you know make themselves feel better and go out with their friends and get drunk and because you know a lot of people go into that uh, completely the opposite side where they start to get drunk they start to take drugs and for you what was that point where you realized no actually there is a big problem here that I need to address I was suicidal you know I was not well. I um, I remember I um, I really didn't want to embarrass my family mm. by hurting myself because I just thought, oh my god, you know, what would they do um, if if I would do something that people would go, oh, you know, their daughter did this, you know, and I was just so worried about what I might leave it's like the know, perception yeah the guilt and the shaming you know um mm. I would shame my family and I had personal guilt mm. so um I used to think what can I do and one day I just thought no and I walked out in front of the car like it was going pretty fast and I just walked out into the middle of the road and I just wow. thought yeah this will do it and this guy stopped his car. He skidded and he went sideways to my legs. Oh my god! Just touched my legs inside his car. And he jumped out of the car, and he yelled at me. He went crazy at me, and he just oh, said, wow. "How dare you? How dare you step in front of my car? How do you think I would have felt if I'd have killed you?" Oh god! And I just went, oh, "Yeah." Like yeah. a wake-up moment. Wow. Yeah. So what, what were your thoughts then? What were you thinking at that point? I just thought you're right. I was totally selfish, you know? And that is depression. Depression is complete self-centeredness. It's complete. It's a complete implode. Yeah. So not thinking about the external effect of people who we don't care about. I mean, um, even though I didn't want to... Um, do anything too public yeah I still wasn't thinking actually they'd all be a bit upset if I wasn't here mm -hmm. I still wasn't thinking logically it was still self-centeredness that was driving it and he just it was like um it was like being slapped it was massive I mean he yelled at me for a good five minutes and um oh God, he was probably like what the hell <laughs> yeah right oh. you know I mean I can't imagine yeah you know how that would have felt for him. Mm. And he did exactly the right thing, you know? Um, and, and of course I never did it again because he made me see that that was appalling. You know, what would he have done? Like he, he said he had children and that he wouldn't be able to look at his children and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And um, yeah, that was you. That was also you crying out for help though, isn't it? Because it's, I guess when you're in that state, what do you do? You know, what, how do you get help other than just go to extremes, like try to commit suicide? Yeah. Yeah. And I think, um, there's an overwhelm about depression. Um, and I, and, and this is what upsets me when people don't know how to cope with people with depression. Mm. Um, that's just too bad. We have to cope with people with depression. Yeah. You know, we just have to suck that up and be uncomfortable is what we're dealing with. And this is the society we're in at the moment, the inability to discuss these things. Mm, to be open about it. Pushes it further and further underground. And, and in a way now, I feel like mental health is almost like periods used to be back in the day. You know, like we used to be able to say, I'm having, I need a day off work. So you go to your boss and you say, I've got women's problems. And that was, you know, yeah. I'm out, I don't <laughs> have to explain anything. I can just have a full day off without worrying. Whereas now it's kind of like, oh, I need a mental health day. Mm. And it's being, it's kind of the, the new taboo 
but it's becoming mainstream. Yeah. And so we're all missing mm. the, the depth of it. It's, it's almost becoming too talked about to be relevant. But not in the right way, isn't it? They're not. That's right. So, um, yeah, we're aware of how many suicides there are, but it's almost becoming a normal topic of conversation. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Yeah. yeah. And they do, yeah, they do do awareness for it, but I feel like it's still not being addressed in the right way. Um, and it's kind of like a lot of it, from what I've seen, a lot of it is to do with kind of trying to integrate that sort of emotional and spiritual um, um, perspectives, isn't it? Because a lot of it is to do with your kind of, well, your spirit, how your spirit sees the world, how your soul is coping with the outside world, isn't it? And that's something because we're so kind of mental and logical about everything. It's sort of like that aspect has just been shunned. And I feel like it's harder for people to understand it when we're only thinking about things in terms of logical, rational, very psychological type of type of way. But you've done, so you've done a lot of shadow work. Um, yeah. and what you've referred to shadow work. So can you explain a little bit what you mean by that and how, what exactly? Well, shadow work is holding your own darkness, um, acknowledging it. And, and it is the shame and the guilt that goes along with what that looks like. Yeah. Um, there's a, a depth to each one of us where we know there are times where we've behaved well and there's times when we've behaved badly. There's times when we've had arguments and not said the right thing. We've not been appropriate. We haven't shown up like we should have shown up. We made an excuse and didn't do something we said we would do. We procrastinate, we avoid all of these things that we do because not necessarily because we're depressed or anything, just because we're doing life and that's mm. just what we do. We yeah. don't want to go to that party that we promised we would go to and all of these things mm -hmm. that just hang in the bottom of, of who we are. And, mm. and I think for me, my belief is the parenting aspect today as well is very tough. The judgment around parenting and how we're raising our children and, you know, what is good parenting, what's bad parenting and yeah. the pressures around that too. There's, um, you know, you have to give yourself an awful lot of compassion around parenting. And yeah. within that, there's a lot of shadow comes up around who you are because it brings mm. up your own traits and beliefs and your own you know foibles so to speak so for me a lot of the the shadow work is the elephant in the room yeah it's um, you know actually I did that really badly I'm so sorry mm. just simple as that and for most people um the thought of admitting that they're wrong you know room full of people is excruciating like you know it, it's just there's no way and the ego that is held in boardrooms and in in um all these different environments around the world it's almost like a, a force um that this there's this just armor around people of like no this is what i've said and even though it's not right i'm going to defend it to the end and that's shadow that shadow work um, it's people who are dealing with a situation that they're building more and more resentful like a, a carer who's looking after somebody who's got a terminal illness mm. they they could be um, building resentment and like be really angry that their life's been put on hold for this person there's no doubt they love and adore and wouldn't be anywhere else mm. but there's reality for them and their own emotion going on in yeah. the background and and they dared not say i'm so angry with them for dying i'm so angry that i'm having to go through this pain yeah. because you're not allowed you've got to be all loving and just you know selfless and um and we are selfless to be there for somebody in that situation but we can also have the shadow yeah. I was talking to somebody the other week about um an analogy for this because i was trying to explain to her why she should allow herself a shadow. Um, in Peter Pan, for example, the Walt Disney Peter Pan. Yeah, I love He that. left his shadow in the nursery, right? Mm. So Wendy trapped it in a trunk at the bottom of the bed. So this shadow is there on its own, disconnected from Peter. Peter's off being Mr. Neverland. Yeah. But the shadow is fighting away in this box. It's banging and twisting and making a real noise until we have to notice 
that that's where it is. It's being packed away in this box. Yeah. So Peter has to come back for it. Otherwise, it's going to cause a real stink. Mm. <laughs> but the thing is, is that Wendy sewed it back onto his feet because it belonged to him. Yeah. It's his shadow. And he stood up against the wall and waves his arms around and it goes back into doing what he's doing mm. because it mirrors you and it goes wherever you go. Yeah. And when the sun is really bright, it creates a darker shadow. And when the sun is light, the shadow dims. Yeah. So yeah. wherever there's a bright light, there's often a very deep shadow. Mm. And it goes with us everywhere. So we have to recognize it in order to be able to, to move around and, and to not have it overtake anything. We can't ignore it or it'll just sit in the box at the bottom of Wendy's bed making a right old noise, you know. <laughs> um, create more trouble. So do you think what's the kind of, how do you approach working with your shadow? Because yeah, everyone has it, but I guess a lot of us, again, we try to kind of just um, not, not think about it and just get on with our lives until it gets so you know so potent so powerful that we just have to i guess stop and look at it or we just start going out off into doing drugs or doing something that's very negative towards ourselves what, what is the main kind of component or um tool would you say to look at your own shadow how do you approach that aspect of yourself mm. it's not easy darling <laughs> i wish there was an easy answer for it's like the worst thing in the world like i think for me, it was always um, it was always a nighttime thing, where um, everybody would be sleeping, the world would be sleeping, and that would be time for me to really show up and be honest to myself. Mm. Because I've said it before, is at two in the morning, your story is of absolute no no interest to anybody, mm. because you we make stuff up to other people, even though we know it's not the absolute truth. We can use slight exaggerations or a little bit of change story here, a little bit of, you know, um, white lie. But you know what is actually what you think, how yeah. you handle it, what the truth was. Yeah. So in those darker moments, like when the sun's gone down, that it's really quiet, that's when to sit in meditation that. And so you can't do it when you're in the middle of a really deep depression and there's an anxiety. It, that's not the time. Yeah. This is when you're a bit further down the road and you're wanting to really start harnessing who you are as a person mm. um, and you're on kind of a road. So in that, um, I would suggest that there are so many meditations that you can get. I, 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 it's good to play like a really nice kind of subtle music in the background in mm. a simple, your body and then to start really asking questions that you're mm. unsure about and then really really own the answers mm. but okay yeah and if you need to have a cry about it if you need to feel terrible about it sometimes there's a nausea that comes and that's that shaming the guilt the guilt and the shaming it's a stomach thing yeah. So it can cause nausea, it can cause this kind of unrest and then it creates the agitation. Mm. Um, Kundalini meditations are really good for moving um, yeah. energies that comes with um, shame and anger and all of those kind of things. And we start to mm. see where we're not behaving well. And then we have to then make a decision that we're doing the very best we can in the moment. Mm. But from where we've been, from the knowledge that we've had, we didn't mean to do it badly. And we have to, we have to bring our own level of compassion. Yeah. So we have to start talking into it and saying, you did the best that you could. I know that about me. And I, I'm really going to try to make that better next time. Or mm. talk to yourself as if you're your own friend. You know, yeah. like when a friend comes to you and says, oh, I did this. Oh, darling, you didn't mean for that to happen. Blah, blah, blah. Mm. I speak to myself like that. Mm. No, well, I don't, yeah. you know, um, you know, you know why you did that. And it's understandable why you did that. So yeah. maybe we try and do it a bit better next time and try and play it out in your mind how you would like it to happen. Yeah. And then just keep bringing compassion to yourself. Yeah. Why do you think it's important to refer, you know, to speak to yourself and to refer to these emotions almost as if they are kind of like another person, you, you know, within you? Why is that um, sort of a 
key aspect because I've, I've seen it a lot before as well. And it, for me, it seems like it's such a, an important part of healing and kind of, yeah, for, for, what, what, how does it work for you? Why, why is it important to do that? Well, I think um, we, we are our own worst critic. So why can't we be our own healer? Why can't we be our own kindness, our own compassion? We seem to think it's strange to be beautiful to ourselves, to say, hey, I see you. I see you doing your best. Whereas we have absolutely no problem before we walk into a job interview going, you're probably not going to get it. You're rubbish. You're really crap. You know, you're not, oh, that guy there who's just walked out, he's probably going to get the job. We don't see that as another person. Mm. We don't even recognize that it's our own voice. So... It's just the opposite of that. That critical voice is the shadow of the compassion. Mm, yeah. So we're actually doing it all the time. So we might as well at least say, oh, right, so that is me. So if I can say all of those horrible, nasty things to me, it yeah. doesn't seem to be quite panning out to make me a better woman. <laughs> I might just kind of turn the narrative mm. and start being kind. Yeah. And when I hear that, going, wow, I'm being really mean to myself. Mm. You know? yeah. And, and the, the best person you'll ever get the truth from is yourself. Yeah. <laughs> because you're the only one who really knows it. No, it's true. You, you're the only one who really, really knows mm. what you really think in the dark moment. Yeah, totally. Do you see that realization as well in your clients that you've worked with? Do you kind of, you know, do they come to this point where they realize, oh, actually... I do have all the answers. Obviously, it's, 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 they always need someone to kind of guide them to that place. But in the end, what are the biggest realizations that you've seen from working with your own um, clients in shadow work? Well, I think when almost, with people, a lot of people aren't even in the headspace to be thinking about even what a feeling is. Mm. They're just coming with their day or they're coming with their reaction or they're coming with that guy's an asshole or she's been a bitch, or they don't do what I want. He's, and it's a, a whole lot of outward fingers. Yeah. Pointing. Mm. When you start to actually reflect back to them, um, so talk to me about blah, 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 completely unrelated. Yeah. And then things start to drop in for me as the person to go, ah, oh, okay, I can yeah. see that. Yeah, I can see that. Okay, I see it. And so from that kind of... Um, that space of getting to know them a little and then intuitively working out how they're um, navigating their own um, blocks. Mm -hmm. You can say, so, so how do you feel about such and such? Oh, well, blah, blah, blah. So what about if this happened? And then they go, oh, uh, and you just kind of start almost weaning out yeah. what part they're playing in it. Yeah. Without it um, intimidating or accusatory. Mm. to kind of be the role that they're playing within it until the penny drops for them. Yeah. And then you can say, and, and then you hold it in compassion, you know? So for me, when I was working with um, people struggling with um, depression or um, adjustment disorder or stuff like that, men, yeah. I created a bit of a, a emotional matrix mm -hmm. where I discussed with them different things they were feeling and going through. And then we would apply, I would explain an emotion, say, so the emotion that goes with that, what do you think it is? Are we, what's it feel like in your body? Is it hot or cold? Or is it like, is it kind of exciting or is it this? And we would end up with the emotion. Mm, yeah. And, so to describe and a lot of the time, it was not a pleasant emotion. It yeah. was, you know, and so we would put that on the board and say, well, so with this emotion, you know, what, do, what can we see that's positive about this emotion? So, for example, um, a lot of people coming back from conflict environments are angry. Yeah. And um, so we say, okay, well, what, what kind of, you know, benefits have we got around anger? Mm. Well, actually, without anger, we can't fight for justice. You know, we can't. So where do we use this anger? It's a passion. Okay, so we when we're needing to fight for something, we need that part of us. We need to get angry about something to drive us to go, hang on a minute and face the difficulty, yeah. face the conflict. Yeah. And within that, I mean, you know, if Greenpeace was just a bunch of hippies on a boat, it, it, <laughs> it wouldn't do anything. They, they're angry, you yeah. know, 
Yeah. And that, that's, that drives them. They're furious about what's happening. And so the green peace with the anger creates a movement. Great. Yeah. So it, it's a justice, it's a passion, it's a driver. So then when they start to see that as guys, they go, oh, oh, that's a good thing. Yeah. You go, yeah, that's a good thing. So we can start to identify the, these negative emotions and see the benefits mm. and see the unrealized, these benefits do turn from, you know, unchanneled anger turns to a rage, which is uncontrollable, which then is destructive. Yeah. Heading in the wrong direction yeah. because it's it's kind of directionless. Mm. Uh, it's just going outwards. Yeah. yeah. So it's kind of like how do you channel it and contain it and channel it into the right into a yeah. positive thing? Yeah. yeah. And yeah. I think for the masculine, um, it's important to to understand it. It's like taking a, an engine apart, putting it back together. Yeah. Oh, that's how it works. Okay, cool you know yeah. so being able to deconstruct an emotion and then reconstruct it yeah. in a way that they can understand and then apply the positives to it exactly. as well as the negative okay so you're feeling angry how can we harness it how yeah. can we really use that and how can we bring that forward and then there's a, a sadness that's turned to depression so you know but what's that sadness done it's built as compassion it's built as empathy it's built as understanding for a fellow man so where can we channel that to start to use this depression to actually help and assist others and yeah. it actually brings them into that kind of the giving space and wow. and then that kind of chills down the anger and you know it's really it's yeah. really extraordinary how they all been together yeah, that's pretty powerful. And I think you 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 said such a key thing about um, people not even being aware of what they're feeling in the first place. And I've noticed that a lot with so many people, they're literally just walking completely disconnected from their emotions. They're kind of just like a walking head, you know, and they're just completely unaware of anything that is going from the head down in, in their body, their emotions. And that's such a huge problem, especially for men, I think, because men are even more so disconnected with their emotions or have been at least in the past because of everything you know of the whole macho kind of stereotype so that's such a huge huge thing to um yeah just to even admit to isn't it that people are just not even aware of what they're feeling and that's crazy because we're human beings and if we're so disconnected what makes us so different from a robot because a robot yeah. can calculate they can think you know they can compute things so if we don't connect with our emotions it's kind of like well we're no different than a robot really Mm. And I think there's this allowance where it's a it's a weakness. It's been seen as a weakness. Don't cry. Mm. You know, they used to get hit. Don't cry. And so there's in our DNA and in our ancestral line. Yeah, it's it's actually dangerous to cry. It's actually a big problem to be weak. You know, there's there's danger in it. Yeah. So there's a risk that they run every time they let somebody in. Whereas for me, I point out to them the absolute courage and bravery in showing up with their emotions. For a perceived weakness, it's actually their very greatest strength. Mm. And, and to actually pre present within these, these areas that are so um, hard to show up in, mm -hmm. for me, it's the most courageous thing yeah. of all. Yeah. Totally. Yeah, mm. and I have ultimate respect for somebody speaking into a dark space. I I just because only by that can it ever be moved, mm. and so I know it's almost like I could cry about it because it's kind of like when you see somebody embrace that part of themselves and shed compassion or light into it, or even the slightest understanding. Mm. There's this moment in me that knows that we've started that the change has started exactly. and that they're opening and that something's about to, you know, and, and they get universally supported in that, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. Such yeah. A big yeah. Thing for yeah. And I know you, you mentioned before about, you know, the, one of the most exciting things in, in what you do is kind of, you know, seeing that spark in someone's eyes when they kind of have that light bulb moment and like, Oh my God. Yeah. That's, that's what it is. That's the problem. Or that's the mm. realization. It's such a, um it's just such a powerful moment and that's definitely just like this catalyst that just psh, everything everything before that is kind of like yeah it's the heart opening you know because yeah. when like you say if we're walking heads that 
the brain and the heart are disconnected. Mm. And we're so busy stuffing our feelings with food or with drink or with alcohol um, and with drugs. And so we're, we're going stomach to brain. Mm. And of course, all of the scientists are proving that, you know, brain kind of gut connection. There's yes. so much health, mental health issues caused from what we're putting into our bodies exactly. and from our, the gut bacteria straight up to um, mental health issues. Yeah. And in the middle of that is our heart. And it's been completely bypassed. Exactly. And if we were able to go from our mind into our heart, we don't need to fill our belly almost. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's food. It's food for thought. It comes from the center of your being. So if we can start to open people from their heart out, then it fills your belly. Um, and it makes you want to be kinder to yourself. It changes your um, the way that you treat yourself, and it gives you nicer thoughts. And yeah, and there's it attracts more um, beautiful things. It attracts love. It attracts love and connection, which yeah. it goes back to that original thing. And that is why we're here. And there's so much um, narrative now, especially I'm a single mom, and I totally get it that. We don't need men to survive and all that. And we definitely don't. We're perfectly capable. But yeah. you know what? Gee, it's nice. Mm -hmm. You know, it's lovely exactly. to have yeah. somebody in your life that you love. And we are made to connect. Mm -hmm. We are made to, and we, we get shamed for needing people. Exactly. We're all on this path of independence. I'm financially independent. I'm emotionally independent. What a horrible thing. You know, yeah. and yet we celebrate it as if yeah. it's some kind of win, yeah. and we're not allowed to say, "Actually, can I get some help over here?" Yeah. Whereas, really, that is almost the downfall of our society today, totally. because we're all meant to be there for each other. We are meant to reach out. We're meant to be a part of a village, a part of a a group, a tribe. A tribe. And as long as we can do that, then then we keep that heart open mm. because it's being accessed by all these people in our community and we're giving and we're also receiving. Yeah, um, totally. Yeah. yeah, that reminds me of um, this really interesting study that um, I watched and it was on TED Talks and it was a guy I think called Stivert Iliadi or something like that, but he did, he has um, a, a clinic where a lot of people who have suffered with severe depression go to. And they were doing a study, like a really long-term, uh, long, longitudinal study, where they found that um, the key components, the key things that all people had in common who suffered with severe depression, um, well, th there were a few things that they listed and things like it was uh, stuff like um, not getting enough sleep, not getting enough sunlight. But one of the main things was not having a community, not being in a community. And they compared these um so this group of people to a group of people in a tribe who were i think they live somewhere in a remote island uh, and obviously the people were this this tribe and they were you know they were just part of a community and you know they they, they had no depression they had of course other problems but they, they didn't suffer with a depression in terms of the typical western clinical way that we view it so they were comparing you know these people to those to the westerners and saying what are the differences and the biggest difference was is that these people live in a community they do everything together they laugh together they cry together they bury you know the dead together so th there was this huge thing about having a community and i can see it over and over again in people you know it's like if you have that support um it just makes so things so much easier to 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 mm. go through yeah yeah so and that's my whole gig, I suppose, yeah. is I, that's why I say permission granted to show ourselves to our community so that our community can be comfortable in showing themselves. Mm. And therefore, we give of ourselves and then we receive. We receive support from the people around us, which makes them feel a million dollars. I mean, I give to others and I feel good about me. That that feeds that that kind of depression in me is lifted by giving yeah. you know so it, it repairs mm -hmm. it repairs yeah. and so by then offering out our, we're constantly being expanded mm -hmm. and as we keep expanding our heart as to our ability to give mm -hmm. by being filled then how can how can that not be a 
a beautiful place like it's and and so the vulnerability that we're all talking about at the moment showing up vulnerable and people will love you if you're vulnerable and show you vulnerability and blah 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 and and even with that people are showing up with that in a contrived manner yeah. to say well I'm gonna say this but I'm gonna say it in a way that gets me sympathy yeah rather than I'm gonna show up and be raw in my vulnerability with snot <laughs> 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 not looking not great really. yeah it's actually, and then, and then we're, we've got our heart open, ready to receive. Mm. Um, and then people do, they pour into that space because down in the base of who we are, we all have this, this love for our fellow man. And you see it playing out in disasters. Mm. When there's a big disaster, we're knocked to our core. And we come from our core. Yeah. So that's when you see the enormous capacity for giving and receiving of love and support. But then we all kind of lock it all down because we all get busy with what we're doing and back to proving ourselves and exactly. being independent. Yeah, no, it's so true. Yeah, whenever you get any disasters and you see people, you know, saving dogs, saving cats, saving anyone, you know, they can giving the food away. And then the minute everything go, goes back to normal, it's like, okay, I'm going to forget about everyone else now. I'm going to focus on back on myself. Yeah, I mean, the most famous example of that was 9 11, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. In New York, a very um, individual type place yes. and the community that came together from a terrible tragedy um but there was so much beauty came from such a terrible oh, yeah. event yeah it's such a shame that we can't actually just harness that mm. on a day-to-day -day basis yeah. totally yeah. it is yeah so where do you see your work with the, the gentleman's secret going where where would be the most ideal place that you wanted to see it evolve to mm. Well, I think having conversations with men um, on the Modern Masculine podcast is also research for me. Mm. I just, I don't really know what guys think. Um, and I wouldn't even be that ridiculous to pretend that I do. I've got no idea. So it's of interest to me to find out what they think. And of course, like, like everything, I, there'll be hundreds and hundreds of different opinions from each guy. Yes. So as well, we need to recognize the diversity within our male population as well. Exactly. But the main thing is, is that there's a whole load of stuff being thrown into this area. And I'd just like to show the softness and the love and the compassion that men are capable of yeah. and that they have these deep wounded stories too. Um, I was chatting to a, a friend of mine um, who was saying, you know, like, I'm just so busy at the moment. I've got this happening. And then, you know, the kids are coming over. And, and had I put that narrative up online and put a woman's film behind it, it would have looked like a story from a woman, mm. a busy working mum. Yeah. Totally. But it was a guy. And because I said to him, I know exactly how you're feeling, you know. <laughs> Yeah. And he's having the same experience as me. And he needs to be allowed to say that he's having the same experience as me, where I feel that we're sh we shut down men a lot by going, oh, you're not doing anything that we're doing. Like, we're doing it all. But that is still our choice, you know? Yeah. We can say, yeah. well, I'm not doing the dishes. You do the dishes. <laughs> but we almost martyr ourselves into being the better sex, almost. Yeah. yeah. We don't need to take that role mm. it's still a choice um sure you're deciding to have a bit of a standoff of living in a dirty house but you know like what i mean is that yeah. every everything we draw in is a choice that we've made no, exactly. um, so on having these conversations i'd really like to bring just a light to to that beauty within the masculine and also i would like to have the controversial questions and get some of the more kind of like darker opinions from yeah. some of their guys where they are chauvinist that they mm -hmm. are um you know um insensitive when it comes to things like me too i'm wanting to have those conversations as well yes. so we can hear that so yeah. that it can be good yeah. and i can say you know well this is probably where we're coming from and of course my opinion is not the opinion of every woman my opinion is my opinion and yeah. i just happen to be a woman yeah. 
Mm. Um, so I'm by no means talking for women either. Yeah. But within Gentleman's Secret, um, I, my kind of person, my client in that area is somebody who's kind of middle age, 45, 50, been through divorce, and he's pretty much punishing himself by living in a kind of a bit of a holding cell and not really having the progression of the next stage of his life doesn't quite know what to do his children aren't really around him he doesn't have any kind of warm and fuzzies from the work that he's doing every day and so it's about giving these guys the tools that they've never mm-hmm. known were available like we said the cut off of the neck no mm-hmm. heart no nothing we've been functioning as a bloke this is our training we've provided for our family what's the problem they've got no idea how to show up yeah. emotionally Totally. never been shown so it's about then saying well would you like to know how to do that mm-hmm. um and within that as well building a network of men who can connect without me being around so men who then meet with men who are in the same situations mm-hmm. who are clients who can come together we can have dinners and we can have a contemplation about a subject where they start talking at a deeper level with other men yeah. in their situation so that they create their own support network mm, um, that's because awesome. men be speaking to men so um wow i want to go in and kind of like start a process with that person but yeah. also they need to then have their own community they have yeah to have a connection with their own connections with, yeah. with other men. Mm. wow that's so powerful that's i mean that's something so different and i've never I've never really come across anything like that. So I think it's so special what you're doing because there needs to be something like that very much in our, in our society. I can see it totally. And a lot of people agree as well that, you know, the whole macho archetype doesn't stick anymore. It doesn't help anyone. It's not real. And it's just making everything so much worse than it actually is. But I mean, we need to talk about sex as well. You know, like sex is a huge thing that isn't being talked about. We need to be talking about sacred sexuality, Mm. about, you know, the divine feminine and the divine masculine. Yeah. About that beautiful king, queen energy and about how to actually come together in that energy to partner. Yeah. And how do you see that sort of energy, the two energies from a spiritual perspective? Spiritually, I think that there's this beautiful balance within each of us. So there's this beautiful masculine feminine balance within each of us. And I was speaking to somebody the other day about this who is really well versed in in, um, his own masculine. Mm. And it's about the ability for um, the man and the woman. So I, I feel for me, the biggest strength is for me to find a man who is powerful enough to hold me in my power. Mm. and then I need to be that woman who can be strong enough to hold him in his weakness. Yeah. So it's about me holding his weakness in my feminine Mm. and about him being able to embrace my passion and my power in his masculine. So we become that kind of reflection of each other, but the woman gets to hold herself in softness and he gets to hold himself in that power. And the beauty of that and the strength and the confidence and the kind of expansion is quite extraordinary. And to be able to connect on that level of complete respect Mm. for each other in that space um, and not be threatened by either of it. So they're not trying to belittle you for being powerful by berating you as, as, you know, somebody who's coming at them um, and aggressive and all of this rubbish narrative around women who you know have just got good shit going on mm, yeah and, uh, and also we're not getting women who are going oh you know he's a bit weak or you know i just want this strong guy like if that's what we want then we need to be able to hold it mm, yeah totally. and i've never seen a man end up being as powerful as when they're being held properly yeah. and, and really the other way yeah um, yeah, where where that's that for me is that beautiful connection, mm. and so um, I'd like to be able to with clients teach them that balance that when yeah. they get a new girlfriend they go, oh my god, she said this, I've got no idea how to navigate this. <laughs> you can 
well, your masculine power. <laughs> direction. And so you need to stand here with this and don't be afraid of that. She doesn't want you to be afraid of that. She wants you to go, actually, no, this is how I feel, but I still respect where you're coming from. Yeah. It doesn't mean either of us ever has to release who we are, mm. but we just need to be able to fully respect and try to come to the party of the other person. Yeah, totally. You know? so, yeah. yeah, there's a, a real uh, beauty in the match of a divine masculine by mm. coming both of your energies. Yeah. And um, yeah, I think it's, it's a very special thing. No, definitely. Yeah, and a lot of people kind of, I think talking about it more and more now and, and you know they do say that we all have the the masculine the feminine energies be, um, within us you know the yin and the, and the yang so it's not kind of like just because you're a man you're only masculine or just because I'm a woman I'm only feminine no it's kind of like we all have those energies within us so it's really to what extent do we use one or the other or do we try to balance it yeah mm. so I think that's really important yeah. I think when you've got, and some guys have got much more of a feminine influence mm. than, than the masculine. So within your relationships, that's where the balance is. Yeah. So um, that's the decision that you make. You know, yeah. for some yeah. women, um, they, don't, they don't want to have much of the masculine. They're kind of like, you know what? I'm actually not into that. I just really want, I just want to be at home with my kids and I want, a guy to go to work. I just want that old fashioned setup, yeah. but it's perfect. And I'm like, fair play to you. If that's what you want, darling, you go and get that. There's nothing wrong with that. And it means that then you're getting a guy who's a lot more in his masculine, yeah. um, you know, but he still has this love and admiration for this really soft, nurturing woman who he loves. Mm. And then sometimes it's the other way where a woman really is a more powerful, more masculine character. She's, that's who she is. Mm. And so she wants somebody who's not going to fight her on that, who's a lot more is feminine to kind of go, yeah, darling, you, you go for that because I've got no, no intention of battling that with you. Yeah. So it depends on, on what works for you it's personally. what works you for you, yeah. Work that out and find that person who can reflect that back until the scales are level. Yeah. And yeah, and really be okay with kind of just being your equal, isn't it? Because this whole, the old idea that we have – you know, that men have to go to work and because they earn the money, they seem to have the highest status in the house. That clearly doesn't work for a lot of women. Yeah, of <laughs> course. Really this whole redefine this whole thing. But what, do you, what do you think about um, women who, um, you know, want to be taken seriously in their work? And um, do you think we have to kind of tone down the feminine nature, uh, the feminine side of our sort of, um, personality because I, I often find that at least I've had this perception that in order to be taken seriously I have to um, not make as much of an effort to look good because I feel like if I do then I would just be taken as this person as oh she just she probably just this bimbo I know it sounds so yeah but it's like a typical stereotype and I know it doesn't really like a lot of uh, people have a lot of course we have so much more to us but there's this typical stereotype that you know if you look very good then maybe you you, you know totally very good. I totally get what you're saying mm. and and that's real you know you're not making that up and I know it's even difficult for you to say it isn't yeah, I know. it's like I don't want to <laughs> I, going like, I don't even want to say this because it just sounds so terrible yeah. but you're right you know that is like that's the elephant in the room right you yeah. know this is the stuff I'm talking about mm. and I remember um, at the schoolyard, mothers hated me. They mm. absolutely hated me. And, um, I, and I took that on. So mm. I made myself really small. Mm. Um, and I mean, I, did, I, I, I wear heels every day. That's why my nickname was always Hippie in Heels yeah. because <laughs> here I am kind of, you know, random hippie, but yeah. I'm always in heels. And, and, um, but people didn't know me at all. Mm. They just thought I was like, this glamorous interior designer which of course they instantly hated yeah so um, and and then I then went okay well I'll be nothing and I'll just make a big fuss of all of you not being amazing mm. and then in the end I ended up just not participating just realizing that okay well you're not going to talk to me okay mm. and um and so now I've changed my own narrative around that and I walk into, because I've like my son's nineteen. He's just left, and as he was leaving, my twins are six, so they mm. were going into kindy. 
Yeah. And I went in with a boundary and I went in with an energy of like, no, I'm going to make friends here mm. um, because I'm a lot more than what you're looking at. Yeah. And, um, and I just went in and I, I just had a completely different energy and it was an energy where I, I wasn't going to believe that already. Mm. Um, whereas before when I went into the schoolyard I was like oh they're gonna think this of me they're gonna think that of me which of course I was right and then I attracted it and yeah. now um, of course there's still people who you know they're uncomfortable around you because mm. you make them feel in, inadequate yeah but that's exactly. actually not my energy that's theirs yeah. that's their problem and, yeah that's them yeah and I just think you know I, I can totally feel for you I'm sorry you feel like that about yourself but um, I'm looking in my tribe now. I say I'm looking for people who love themselves enough to love me. Yeah. And um, I, I, I don't know whether you've seen any of my poetry. I have. A, a, I do a lot of poetry, and I oh. post. It. And um, it's on my Helen Glover Own It Facebook page. Oh. And on there, that's where a few of my poems are. And I wrote a big piece on. <laughs> I'll send it to you actually. Oh yeah. On, please do, yeah. Um, on being loving yourself enough to to love me you know yeah. whether you know they can actually cope with me being big enough yeah um, yeah or whether they want me to be small and if they mm. want me to be small i just can't help them anymore exactly you know? you're not going to reflect yeah. their own yeah i mean you are but reflecting their insecurities yeah. yeah this mm. is why though this journey is really like oh my god there's this there's this still this kind of belief system and this training in the subconscious in the old filing system yeah. you're not allowed to be this big yeah exactly you, to, you know because mm -hmm. you that thing where you say I didn't look too beautiful because people aren't going to take me seriously yeah. I'm like I didn't be this outward or this open or this because I will be hated for it like yeah. people won't like me to be honest it's boundaries darling it's boundaries we all have to kind of go you know I can actually be this and I can be that. And I have a boundary. And when we set a boundary, it's an energetic, hey. <laughs> exactly. And people can feel it. And the respect is there. Mm -hmm. So it's like any relationship. I mean, these are my beliefs, right? So yes. I believe when we walk into any relationship, we walk in with an energy of how we believe we're going to be treated. Yeah, totally. So we walk into that space and we go, this is the boundary. Mm. I can laugh at that joke, a little bit sexist, but you know, I'm all right with it. I'm, I'm confident. Yeah. That's okay. That one, not acceptable. Yeah. yeah. So we teach people how to treat us. We actually hold that boundary. Yeah. If we walk in and we just kind of want to giggle and, you know, let them have their fun and, and there is that element where there's that sexism and there's the kind of pushing boundaries on what can I get away with here? Yeah. We call that boundary in that in the first few interchanges. Mm. So we have to take responsibility for what we are and are not willing to put up with. Yeah. And equally, men need to come to the party as well to say, hey, don't speak to this person like that. And, mm. and there's this big movement now for men to come up to men who are being abusive to women. You know, mm. that they need to set the boundary too, to say, you know, with domestic violence, what we need is for men to stand up to men and say, don't speak yeah. to her like that. Don't treat her like that. Mm. Because men and men have that, like, kind of warrior tribal yeah. respect. Mm -hmm. So both of us need to set boundaries around these areas. Yeah. And only by both of us knowing that we need equal respect in that area are things ever going to change. So we, if we're not getting respect, we need to ask for it. You know what? this is my boundary and by drawing that boundary it's the same thing as i spoke about it's almost that permission granted they go oh that's the boundary okay and they set the boundary yeah they know yeah. that that's not going to work in front of you they're aware that when people talk like that in front of you in the office that you're not going to be happy and they kind of will you'll notice they'll go hey guys you know calm mm. down a bit. that's not appropriate mm. whereas if you hadn't said anything they'd probably go for it yeah totally yeah so, so yeah i guess it is just as much as our responsibility to kind of set those boundaries in big it's, for, it's yeah. both of us you mm -hmm. know we both have to set the boundary and and we have to be brave yeah you know totally. to, to step up and 
and say, no, that's not acceptable to me. I'm not having that. And that doesn't mean that we're being aggressive or in our masculine. Mm. It just means that um, we're, we're drawing a line because it's, just... it's not acceptable behavior to us as women. Yeah, exactly. And, um, and I know that if we're talking about the elephant in the room, there's that kind of, oh, she's being hysterical. Oh God! Yeah, oh, she's <laughs> awfully emotional. Or she's this, or she's that. Yeah, but we have to just not buy into it. Yeah, just have to go. You know, that's kind of that that thinking that we don't need to buy into, so that we can just stay in our own change consciousness. Yeah, because as, as a planet, we need to be changing our own consciousness to not buy into anybody else's crap. So, if that's coming at you yeah not appropriate we draw our own boundary and we just keep our own consciousness mm. at that level yeah and that's kind of all we can do we can't actually change how they're going to behave towards Someone us else. yeah exactly um but the more people that do that the quicker the change mm, totally and where do you see kind of humanity going in in the next say 20 years do you see a big change from everything that you're observing so far Oh God, well, if you look at what's happened in the last 20 years, yeah. crazy. I mean, there's so much consciousness talk now that before mm. you would be like, no, I'm just going to talk about that with my small little select group of hippies that I see kind yeah. of once a fortnight in that group or, you know, once a year at festivals, I can really let my hair down. And, yeah. you know, whereas now it, it's a general conversation. People are aware of spirituality, meditation starting to be put into schools, yeah. research is being done now that science is starting to back up the spirituality. You yeah. know, I mean, even saging, like I'm a big white sage smudge yeah. person. Me too. But actually, it's been scientifically proven now that it actually does change the energy in a room. It actually changed the ions and all this kind of stuff. Oh, so. Yeah. There's actual science backing up these things now, mm. you know, all of the studies on the water that you speak, the negative thoughts into the water and the actual uh, particles of the water changes and yeah. you get angry water, you know, yeah. and then we go <laughs> our bodies. But the science is now backing this stuff up. I mean, 20 years ago, if you would have said, oh, you're making that water angry. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we're still borderline on it now, but, but still the science is there. You know, they're starting to study in schools that if you speak nicely to a plant, it grows faster. Yeah. And all of these things are so fabulous, so beautiful. We're, in, we're bringing them in at young ages. My children go to a beautiful school where they do silent sitting every morning. Wow. And they live... That's amazing. The, yeah, like to, to, to human characteristic values rather than to yeah. rules at the school. Mm. They do yoga and they have a mm. no waste policy. So they do um, talks around all that kind of stuff. And yeah. so I think that we just have to remain in a state of hope mm. always that we're going to be doing the very best we can. Um, and that means by acknowledging what's not being done great so that we can change it. Yeah. We can't just um, pretend it's all okay. Totally. Change hurts. Change hurts. Going from being depressed to feeling happy hurts. It's mm -hmm. not an easy process. Oh, yes. Um, each time gets better and we get better and better at handling it until, you know, we can kind of turn it around in a day, yeah. you know, whereas... Um, any, any change hurts and we have to be prepared to have the difficult conversations. We have to be prepared to shine the light mm. on the dark stuff and call it out. Yeah, totally. Talk about the elephant in the room. Yeah. You know? mm. Yeah. But this is how it starts, isn't it? With um, wonderful people like you doing, uh, you know, and you, Danny. Men together <laughs> <laughs> to speak. Oh, that's what it's about. It's about being authentic and just being raw with your truth and just being yourself, you know, putting all your cards on the table and just saying, this is who I am. No more pretends. Mm. That's it. Yeah. That's how it starts. Totally. It's hard. I mean, I, I feel constantly exposed doing stuff like this. You yeah. Know? I'm, I'll probably listen to this and cringe half my way through it. Like going, Oh my God. Cause you don't witness yourself as a third person. So mm -hmm. when you do, it's a nightmare. Like it, it's right. not, fun. 
it's not yeah. fun hearing yourself on an answer machine half mm. the people don't they go do I sound like that <laughs> so it's not um it's not a walk in the park um showing up because you you're open to be judged and rejected and mm. um and, and it feels horrible mm. but we have to um yeah, just have to keep showing up with kindness, I suppose. Yeah, absolutely. And there's a there's a sort of a liberation in in all that, even though it's really really hard. But once I've I've noticed that once you do do that, like the first step that you take, and um, I mean, like you you've said that so many people you know contact you kind of on a daily basis and saying you know these are the problems that I'm having, and just that in itself is huge, because that means you know a complete stranger is going to you and asking for help and asking for guidance that's that's a huge thing so Mm. it must feel so um kind of you know rewarding i guess and and liberating that you are actually being yourself and you're being and you're getting people to actually come to you and say yeah i love your work i love what you're doing Mm. i think there comes a point where you have to decide what you're not doing for the fear of not being loved Mm. and so we need to ask ourselves that question. What am I not doing that's important to me that I really want in my life for the fear of not being loved? And really, if there's something big for you that you're not doing, whoever's not going to love you in it is not your person. Yes. You know, the people who are meant to be in your life will love you in the stuff you really want to do. It's, you have to keep pushing the boundaries on your own safety. Mm, yeah totally otherwise we'll just be stuck in the safe zone forever and then you and then you look back on your life and you think well what have I really done nothing because I was scared of doing x y and z but um, you did recently talk about um ever since you've come out with the podcast you did say that there were a few people a few women from your followers who um unfollowed you tell me tell me a bit about that how did that well I don't really know I mean I I have um a journey within with women myself where I've been treated quite badly by women in my past and I've been treated really badly by men. So I have been treated badly by both sexes. And I've been, I've had beautiful relationships with both sexes. Yeah. So for me, I see it's not a gender thing. It's a person thing, yeah. but a lot of people are very, very, it's like anything. There's the extremes of anything. Yeah. There people who, who just go, Oh my God, you know, I want guys to, be the old school guy, go out and chop wood and, you know, drag home a bear from the forest for me to cook by the fire that, you know, like they're into it. They think that's great. And they'll fight all the way for it. And they, like, I hate feminists. Like some Mm. women just see it as total feminism. And then you get your hardcore people who are like, you know, hardcore feminine who say, you know, you know, guys are responsible for all the problems in the world. Yeah. Um, but a true feminist for me is somebody who wants equality. Mm. And so when we're wanting equality, equality means that we give equal space and equal empathy, equal love and equal consideration. Yeah. It's not just about equal pay. Mm. Yeah. A lot more than all, it's about all of it. And it's not just about who does the dishes. It's about how we show up together as, as a society. Yeah. So I think, and I know that there's an awful lot of hurt out there, um, ancestral hurt. There's stuff that's come through from centuries of things that are really not okay. Like there's a, there's, there is reason for this anger. You know, people have been sexually assaulted. They've been raped. They've been really, you know, they've witnessed domestic violence. Their father has, has hurt their mom. There's lots of, reasons why people carry these things and I can't really judge that yeah but I know it's tender so I know that when I come out to say hey I I want to like shine a light on what guys are feeling as well with the the few to then come together it's almost like I've jumped ship and I'm kind of cheering the other team Mm -hmm. and I knew that that would be the case for some people Mm. and I have empathy around it because they wouldn't feel as strongly about it if it wasn't wrapped up in a whole lot of pain yeah so you have to let people be with whatever reasons they have for it Mm. and again you throw compassion at it um uh, and you can't 
Yeah. But what I did feel is for a while that I was nervous about doing it because I didn't want to upset my sisterhood because mm-hmm. I do get it. And I, and I wanted to make sure that it was understood that I was doing it for that level approach. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, I, I can't, I, like, I can only be responsible for how I show up. So, so I, I just have to respect all sides and go, well, I'll just be doing this bit as to what I feel I need to be doing. And, um, and yeah, I'm sure that I will, I will have to deal with <laughs> opinions of that over the time. And, and some guys going, what do you know about anything? You know, mm-hmm. and other guys going, this is great. Exactly. Happens across the board. Yeah, no, exactly. Everyone's always going to have a different opinion. Whatever you do, even if you're trying to p- just please everyone, it's just impossible. So you might as well be yourself, isn't it? I think that's the moral of the story. And with everything yeah. I've seen as well, that's always the case. If you just, you mm-hmm. might as well try being yourself. And There is a dark side to the sisterhood. You know, there really is. There's a, a real, like, like a big competition between women. And it's not spoken about. We, we do the women's march and yeah, yeah we're all yeah. on the street cheering together. Yeah. But that's not always how it feels on the street. Mm. No. Yeah. Um, no, it's very competitive. Yeah. Especially yeah. nowadays with, um, you know, the whole thing with the TV and the celebrities and trying to look good and trying to look perfect. And yeah, it's very, it's a very negative way to treat each other. But yeah, it's definitely something that's not spoken about as well and not really. Yeah, yeah definitely. Wow yeah wow well helen thank you so much this has been an incredible talk um so insightful there's just so much to gain from it and um again it's such an important theme it's such an important topic that i think it's amazing what you're doing by addressing it and um i can't wait to hear just what you're going to do with it and the gentleman's secret so if people want to learn more about your work do they just go to the website helenglover.com Com. Well, my, because it's all just being developed at the moment, to be honest, there's the yeah. helenglover.com.au um, website. They can contact me by email on connect at helenglover.com.au. The gentlemansecret.com domain is just being de- developed into a website. So just to keep checking on that. But yeah, um, but yeah if, um, if they want to chat to me at all, connect at helenglover.com.au. Okay, brilliant. Well, thank you so much for your time. Um, I'm going to let you go because I know it's very late for you there. <laughs> All right, Thanks, it's cold. <laughs> so yeah, thank you so much again. And um, yeah, have a wonderful evening. Listeners, I hope you enjoyed this episode of the first series of Bridging the Realm. And I really hope that you can join me on social media where I'll be uh, releasing more news on the upcoming series. If you like the Bridging the Realm content and any of the episodes and you want to see more of it, you can join me on my Patreon page, uh, patreon.com at Bridging the Realm. And for any more information, feel free to email me on my website. Thank you so much and see you soon.